Why are you terrified? Why are you afraid? Do you not yet have faith? After this great act of faith that the Lord presents in today's gospel, the disciples still didn't quite get who he was because they didn't respond to his question. They didn't say, yes, we are people of faith. We know exactly what we're doing. They said, who is this man that he can obey, that he can direct, and the sea and the wind obeys him? They still didn't quite understand who he was. I don't know about you, but for me, sometimes I go to the Lord the same way that the disciples did in today's gospel. When things don't seem to be going the way that I've planned, when things aren't going how I thought they would, I go to the Lord and say, Lord, do you not know that I am perishing here? What are you doing? And the Lord, to me, many times has the same response that he had in today's gospel. Do you still not yet have faith? How many times have we been told in our lives that God will never give you more than you can handle? Have you guys heard that before? It's a lie. Because God sometimes purposely gives you more than you can handle. And he does so not because he doesn't love us, not because he wants to punish us. No, he does so so that we realize that we cannot do this on our own. But we are called to have faith and trust in the Lord. But sometimes, I don't know about you, I go to the Lord and say, how about you have a little less faith and trust in me sometimes then? Because I can't do this. We have sometimes those obstacles in our lives where it's overload and overload and overload sometimes where it's like, Lord, enough is enough. He's like, no, let's go a little bit further. No, a little bit further, but no, but it'll work out. Because even though God doesn't give us everything that we want, he does give us and provide us everything that we need. It's a very important distinction, though. Many times we go to prayer and say, Lord, why aren't you answering my prayers? Why aren't you giving me what I want? And his response is, I am giving you, I am answering your prayers. Just what you need is not what you want. I remember when I graduated high school, I wanted to go play college football. But then I realized that Rudy is bigger than me. And that I wasn't getting into the University of Notre Dame. I went to OU and I thought, you know what? I'm classmates with Adrian Peterson. This is going to work. I'm going to go block for him. And then I realized he's a giant. Not going to happen. That's what I wanted in my life. If I became a walk-on football player at OU, first of all, never happen. Second of all, I'd be in a wheelchair today because I don't know my own abilities. Just ask the kids for Monday. We were here on Monday with our youth camp this week. And (laughs) I thought... I'm 35, almost 36. I'm still young and spry. So we played slip and slide kickball. Sounds like a great thing to do until you realize that you're old and fat. And so my back reminded me just how old or young I was. The first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth times that I pulled a Charlie Brown trying to go and just right on my back. They're like, Father, you okay? Give me a second. But sometimes we don't know what's good for us. Why doesn't the Lord give us everything that we want? Because the world would literally go to hell. But we think that we know better than God. I, in the midst of going to OU, wanting to be this football player but never actually playing football, went and thought, I'm going to graduate with a 4.0 GPA. I'm going to go out there and make millions of dollars. Three semesters later, I dropped out with a 1.3 GPA and realized sometimes what I want takes effort, takes intentionality, but I don't always want to put forward the effort that it takes to get what I want. And so in the midst of that tragedy, In that chaos, I said, Lord, why would you let me fail? He said, because you didn't do it right the first time. Because when I went to OU, when I went off to college, I thought in my pride that I knew best. I don't need God. Yes, I know St. Thomas More is right across the street, but I don't want to go to Mass at 5 o'clock on a Sunday. I'm going to play video games. I'm going to hang out with my friends. And so I didn't go to Mass for that two years that I was at OU, and I wondered, Lord, why have you abandoned me? But he never left me. 
I left him. When I moved back home, which is one of the most humbling things you can ever do, not only admit to yourself, but admit to your parents that they were right and you were wrong, it's the worst thing in the world. Horrible. He agrees, and he's a little one. The worst thing in the world is admitting to your parents that they were right and you were wrong. But I moved back home. I guess that's really funny to all of them. It's fantastic. Moved back home, and the number one rule at home was my house, my rules. You live under my roof. You're going to church on Sunday. So when I moved back home, my dad got my butt out of bed and said, you're going to church. (sighs) Fine. It's free rent. I guess the only rent is I have to spend an hour and 15 minutes with God every week. The 15 minutes because the pastor that I grew up with preaches double the amount of length that I do. Believe that. But we go to Mass. And in my weakness, I found that the Lord had never abandoned me, but he was still trying to talk to me. Like he did when I was in high school. When I went on all of these mission trips and went on all these retreats, I felt this connection with the Lord, specifically through praise and worship. That's my love language with God has always been music. And the Lord had never abandoned me, but he allowed me to make my own mistakes. How many times do we look at our parents and say, please let me make my own mistakes. Stop holding me under your thumb. I had helicopter parents. Sorry, mom, if you're watching. I had helicopter parents. When I went somewhere, this was before everybody had cell phones, you had to call when you got there, you had to call when you left. To this day, if I'm staying at my parents' house, no matter what time I get in, two o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning, though that's way after my bedtime nowadays, but two o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning, I still have to go to my parents' room, knock on the door, open the door, say, hey, I'm home. And I thought growing up that that was because my parents wanted control of my life. What I found, though, in my later life, later life, I'm only 35, but in the later years of my life, wasn't that they wanted control, it was that as parents, my parents could not properly rest unless they knew exactly where everyone was and that we were safe. Changed my whole understanding of what it means to be a parent. I thought as a kid, the role of a parent is to make my life miserable. Anybody else out there? See some of the parents like, yeah, that's me. Miserable, all seven of you, no. But then when my grandfather passed away, I got the opportunity to go with my dad to the funeral, just the two of us. So we road tripped up to New Milford, Pennsylvania, where grandpa was in charge of a sand and gravel company up there. And got up there and grandpa was the fabric that held the family together. And I didn't really understand until that week how much my dad loved me. Because again, I got all of my worst things from him. I'm short, I'm fat, and I'm bald, and it's all his fault. Because that all came from him. I didn't think anything good in my life could have come from him at this point. Again, I was about 20, 21. It was before I was 21, and that'll come back later in the story, maybe. But when I went up there, the day of my grandpa's funeral, my dad said, hey, I'll be back about 11 o'clock in the morning after we'd done the funeral. I said, okay. Didn't think anything about it. Two o'clock comes around. It's like, haven't heard from dad. Let me try texting him. Nothing. Three o'clock, and try calling him. Nothing. Now, it was December in Pennsylvania. Had just had a fresh snowfall. It was getting cold. It was getting dark. It was snowing that day. Four o'clock comes around. Five o'clock comes around. Six o'clock comes around. I'll be back in just a little bit. It's been six hours. A little bit is like 30 minutes. Not answering his phone. So I start freaking out. I start to call my aunt's house. No answer. Uncle's house. No, he's not here. We haven't seen him. We call every family member in the area, which ends up being like 25 phone calls. No one has seen or heard from my dad. At this point, I am at DEFCON freaking out because I drove up here alone with my dad He didn't drive away, he walked away. He's not answering his phone and nobody has seen him. So when he walks in the door at 8.30 in the evening, nine and a half hours, nine and a half hours after he said, I'll be right back. 
Where have you been? I've been at the bar with my brother. How dare you? I began to understand (laughs) some of that love that parents have for their children. That's the same love that our fathers that we celebrate today are called to mirror for us. That as we hear in today's gospel, sometimes we think that our parents don't care. Sometimes we think that our parents don't know what they're doing. Let me, in on a, let, me let you in on a little secret. They have no idea what they're doing. They're doing the best they can with what they have. Give them some breaks. But also pray for them. Pray for your parents. Not that God give them patience to put up with you, but that God give them the grace to love you, and that God continue to work in your heart that you too can love them back. Unfortunately, I realized this my first year as a priest, not all of us have great father figures in our biological parents. That sucks. That's unfortunate. I'm sorry. But in our Heavenly Father, we have the perfect image of love who will never abandon you, never let you down, not always give you what you want, Like my dad never gave me those candy bars or those snow cones growing up, which is why I'm at the snow cone place three times a week. And my diabetes knows it. (laughs) But just because they don't give you what you want doesn't mean they don't love you. Cherish your parents. Cherish your children. It's not that your children have lost faith in you or your parents have lost faith in you. It's just that sometimes tough love is the easiest way to get through to us, as it was in today's gospel. Jesus didn't abandon them in the boat. He just didn't see the big deal with some waves crashing. And sometimes in our lives, we have those crosses to bear, and we have those obstacles in our path, but they're opportunities, not just obstacles. They're opportunities for the love of God to penetrate our hearts so that we can truly embrace his love. They aren't just obstacles to put us under God's thumb. As I've said before, God is not like it is in Bruce Almighty, where Jim Carrey thinks that God is this evil big kid with a magnifying glass and we are the ants of which he wants to kill. No, smite me, almighty smiter, from those words. But our Heavenly Father loves us. And he gives us everything we need. Unfortunately, sometimes that means getting the exact opposite of what we want. I did not want to fail out of college. I did not want to lose my house to a tornado. I did not want my dad to die eight months ago. But in every single one of those tragedies and every single one of those obstacles, the love of God has been present. And the love of God reminds me of the love of the family that I've been given. Do I have a wife? Do I have children of my own? No, but I've got a family bigger than I could ever imagine. But also as a father, pray for me. (laughs) Seriously, pray for me. Pray for Archbishop Coakley. Pray for our bishops, our deacons, our seminarians. Pray for us to have more seminarians. Because without priests, there is no liturgy. There is no mass. Oh, but we could have Eucharistic celebrations and they just consecrate them. If we want to go there, many countries are already there where the priest goes around once a month to celebrate mass. Because there aren't enough priests. In fact, our current vocation director, Father Brian Bittner, was in, in, at OU when he was traveling around in Alaska, um, when he was at OU Medical. And the priest only came around once a month because every priest in that diocese had to have a pilot's license because you couldn't drive to the different villages. You had to fly to them. But even with the transportation of flight, they only had so many priests that they only got the sacraments once a month. In Oklahoma, my brothers and sisters, we are still in mission territory. Though we have doubled our numbers of Catholics, we have halved our number of priests in the last 25 years. We have one ordination this weekend, which is awesome, to keep up with the number of parishes we have without closing any in the next 15 to 20 years. We need about six priests ordained a year for the next 20 years. 
We don't have those numbers. But it's our responsibility then as brothers and sisters in Christ to talk to our young people, to talk to the men that are growing up, and to say, yes, being a husband, being a father is a vocation. Accept it if it's your calling. Yes, being a monk, being a brother, being a priest is a calling and vocation as well. Accept it if you're being called to it. I can't tell you how many stories I've heard of men that have wanted to become priests, but their parents put a kibosh on it. And so because of number four, honor your father and your mother, they never joined seminary and never discerned the priesthood. That's a tragedy. It's a tragedy. But as members of the faithful, we are called to lift each other up, to nourish each other in their vocation. And as we celebrate Father's Day today, it's an opportunity for us to be people of faith. That no matter what squall and waves are going on around us, to trust that the Lord has what is best in mind for us. To trust that he will never abandon us. To trust that he will always protect our hearts and our souls, even if our lives are put on the line. Because ultimately, that is what matters, my brothers and sisters. Not the job you have, not the career you choose, but how the Lord calls you to embrace his love and how we willingly or unwillingly accept, embrace, or reject it. May we choose the Lord today May we be people of faith and be people no longer that don't understand what it means to embrace that faith, that love, and this community.